All kinds of strange things you can do with a very, very rare subject. Yes, sir. How do you know when someone's a good subject and uh, when they are initially hypnotized? I, I have been maintaining for years that the average person in this country is spending 70% of their waking day in a trance anyhow. I know that sounds odd, but I happen to believe it. All you got to do is watch the, the person in casual conversation. Anybody you're talking to, they lose it, they get it back again, they drift in and out. If you could literally clock how much time they spend in the here and now as opposed to their heads in the clouds, most of us are losing about 60 to 70 percent of our waking day anyhow. So when does it start and when does it end is an open question. Hypnosis is not like a light switch, even though I'm making it look like one. Hypnosis is more a continuum. When did these people start being hypnotized? They probably hypnotized themselves before they walked through that door. If they know they're going to be hypnotized, if they know there's hypnosis involved, some of you folks went through a little mental judo. Am I going to do it? Do I want to do it? What would I feel like? I wonder what it would be like. So they walk in here pre-hypnotized and all I got to do is look for the body signals. Now to the second part of your question, what are the body signals? Again, technical name is response attentiveness. A trained hypnotist will look for the following. Catalepsy, a person who's totally focused does not shift or, or jerk around in the chair. They're not readjusting their weight. They're not, I mean, if you, we have this on video and if you ever see the video, when these folks are in the trance, you can sometimes fast forward the video and that's when it becomes startling because nobody moves. You can see they're breathing and that, that even becomes in unison, but they're not shifting, they're not fiddling, they're not scratching their hair, they're not readjusting their weight. You see them. Some people get so cataleptic, they topple over and don't do anything to right themselves. So you look for catalepsy, you look for an ironed out facial expression. If their eyes are open, you're looking for what's called a slow or a reflective eye blink as opposed to a rapid and a conscious eye blink. The breathing patterns will be very regular and deep as opposed to an irregular conscious breathing pattern. There's no gritting of the teeth, there's no tension in the body. Think about it. Last time you saw a person daydreaming, what did you see? I mean, didn't you? Well, that's the look that you learn to recognize. And again, you do it as long as I've been doing it, you do it without analyzing it. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. You don't really sit back with your checklist, but in order to get to that point, I did at one point have to go through a checklist. Because some people want to be hypnotized. Some people are like, take me, take me. You know what I mean? They're, they're clearly not responding hypnotically. They just want to experience it so much that they've stuck their arm up in the air. That would not be a person I'd want to bring up on stage, particularly not risk money with. Yes? To answer the gentleman's question, because it's a good question, if you took an average subject that wasn't as particularly good as these folks and you did it over and over again, would they eventually become good subjects? Absolutely. This is a practice effect. Very famous statement coined by a psychologist named Clark Hull, hypnosis is a habit phenomenon facilitated by practice. The more you do it, the better you get at it, just like anything else. This isn't voodoo. This is just a learned response state that you really can practice, which is why if you did not end up up here, don't say that I can't be hypnotized. Chances are, statistically, you very much can be hypnotized. And the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. One more question, then we'll wrap it up here. Yes, ma'am. How do you know when they're faking and when they're not? Well, if they're untrained, there's lots of ways to tell. In other words, if they're gritting their teeth, if they're moving around, if the, the eye movements will tell you. However, it has been demonstrated quite clearly that a trained person, if you sit down with just a few minutes with a person and say, this is what a hypnosis, hypnotized person does. You know, you don't want to be moving in the chair. You want that slow, regular breathing. Don't grit your teeth. If you train them how to do it, even the best, most skilled hypno hypnotists can be fooled. So, you know, I, I, especially when I bring people up to risk money, I, uh, I'm assuming they've not had training, but were someone to have even minimal training, were most of you, since what I've told you, to come up here and try to fake me out, you would probably succeed. Even the very best hypnotists can be f faked, can be fooled, if the person knows how to fool them. Anything else? Hey, right. hey, yes, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to meet you, Christina. How are you? All right. Thank you for the question. I don't know if you all heard her question. At what age did I decide to become a motivational speaker and what kind of mindset do you have to have to be one? I'll answer the second question first. You've got to be crazy. And the, the first question is, 
if you want the truth, in 1980, I moved to the Hawaiian Islands and I was living out on a very remote part of the Hawaiian Islands. Prior to that, 1976 through 1980, I was a hypnotherapist. I had always had a fascination with hypnosis. Uh, when, I, when I got finished doing what I was doing, I went into private practice as a hypnotherapist, mostly stopping smoking, weight control, etc. I moved out to a very remote corner of the Hawaiian Islands. There was no electricity, no telephone, no public water. It was, it was extremely remote, and there simply was not enough of a population to maintain a private practice for smoking and weight control. So I decided almost by desperation that I would start talking to sales groups to see if they would hire me to train some of their salespeople to use the technique to get more motivated. So I kind of got in it indirectly, almost by a financial necessity. But I've always had a skill in public speaking. I've always loved it. I've always enjoyed it. And uh, you know, once, once I found that I could do it very, very well, um, I've been doing it ever since. Uh, it is a key, I believe, to being successful. I, I think it was Thoreau who said, uh, most men lead lives of quiet desperation. I have never had that problem, uh, and I'll tell you why I think that's the case. I really, really enjoy what I do. I find what I do fascinating, interesting, totally uh, different each and every time. And as a, if you, as you approach your professions in life, I would not approach it as the job or the profession that's going to make me the most money because as you saw earlier, money doesn't motivate people. Ultimately, I would approach a profession that you really find fascinating, something you really enjoy doing, something that really you have a passion for. That is what I think satisfies people much more than any kind of money. And I was simply fortunate enough to, you know, the, the situation I found myself in, I took advantage of it, and that is how it happened. Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. What do you think? <laughs> I'm going to throw that question at you. Is it, uh, I, I, my first answer would have to be no. I don't think it's possible to hypnotize a dead person. And I, I, don't, think, and I don't think you can hypnotize chicken. You know, wake up, wake up. You know, although apparently it was... A, oh, deaf. I'm sorry. They said deaf. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be facetious. I thought you said dead person. I apologize. Yes, it is very much possible to hypnotize a deaf person. Hey, three times now... And, and, it, and I'm getting ready for the fourth. Three times now, I have spoke to international audiences. Uh, back in, I guess, 1997, Prudential Insurance hired me to speak to their international conference where it was 5,000 Japanese who did not speak any English, Japanese, Chinese, Brazilians, Italians, and something else, and they all had translation headphones on. So I would say something, it would be translated, it would take 10 seconds to translate it or something, and then they'd get it. Now that's weird, because if you're talking and you say something funny, and then 10, 20 seconds later, that section starts laughing, and you go, what they, oh, oh and, then, and then they start laughing, and then they start laughing, very bizarre. But you had to hypnotize them with mime. You had to do it without really using a lot of language. And it worked, and I did that in Istanbul. I did it for that international audience. I did it in um, Hong Kong, and I'll be doing it the 24th of April in Egypt. I've been hired by the YPO. Yeah, I'm going to Egypt on the 24th and then off to Rome again. So, and they all use translation. So yes, you can hypnotize deaf people. You can do it by mime. Do, pardon me? Oh, see, that's not hypnotizing a deaf person. That's just using nonverbal communication. So, I mean, you don't have to use words. And, and I have been doing that, that's another thing, I, I have been doing that the entire presentation. Breathing deeply, you know, ooh, if you watch, I mean, as I say, there's all kinds of things going on here that you may not be watching. I got, I'm sorry, sir, if you hold that, I'll answer it afterwards. Uh, I've been given the signal, I got five minutes to get off stage, so what I need to do is wrap these guys up. I need to unwind them. I want you all to listen very, very carefully, especially the person sitting out in the audience, as I count backwards from three down to one. As I count back from three down to one, every suggestion that I gave to you while you're sitting up here is going to be totally and completely removed. I repeat, every suggestion I gave while you were up here is, or out in that seat is going to be totally and completely removed. Still drifting very, very deep asleep, but I, when I reach number one, all the suggestions I gave are back to the same before you walked in here. Three, going deeper and deeper. Two, more and more relaxed. Every suggestion erased. Three, two, and one. Deep asleep now, very deep. Beautiful. Excellent. I got one more. Yeah.